I am Pocho Salcedo, and I welcome our audience in Latin America and the United States, once again exploring with you the DNA of regional and international news. Today, we will talk about the Apollo project that aimed to explore the moon with mancrafts. 33 astronauts were on the mission from the moment they left Earth until their rescue from their capsules upon their return. They spent a total of 2,503 flight hours. According to our guest, the author of a significant research on this project, it is estimated that each flight hour required more than a million hours of preparation and monitoring on the ground. Be ready to learn little known details and a fresh analysis of what this historic undertaking was and the lessons learned from the Apollo mission in the 1960s. We give a warm welcome to a master storyteller, researcher, and bestseller author, Charles Fishman. He joins us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show, Charles. Thank you so much for having me. What a great story this is, isn't it? Charles Fishman is el aclamado autor de One Giant Leap, A Curious Mind, The Walmart Effect, and The Big Thirst. Es tres veces ganador del premio Gerald Love, el premio más prestigioso en periodismo empresarial. It is an extraordinary story, and um, One Giant Leap is not only a great book uh, because it's an extraordinary account of this incredible period, uh, but it breaks away from the traditional presentations of the Apollo missions in general and the landing on the moon in particular. You Your book um, weaves the stories of about 410,000 citizens that made it uh, possible for this amazing uh, achievement. So uh, we also talk about the environment, the political, the social environment that prevailed at that time. What kind of theme or themes stood up the most as you were researching this book? Let, let's not scare people. It's not about all 410,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, The, the race to the moon in the 1960s w was really a product of the moment in time. Uh, it was motivated, first of all, by the Cold War. If there had not been this Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, there was nothing cold about the Cold War. It was a hot war. And the, the, the Soviet Union was really... Um, uh, embarrassing the United States by doing brilliantly in space in ways that the Americans were not. And so uh, President Kennedy felt like uh, the, the Soviets were making a point to the world about their own excellence, which embarrassed the U.S. and made the U.S. look like it was behind. So the, the initial motivation for going to the moon was to reestablish this sense that, that Americans really Uh, were the best at science and technology and engineering. But going to the moon took eight years, nine years. Um, that's actually a very short time since all of the technology to do it had to be invented during that time. But that's a, that's a period that lasted from, you know, 1961 to 1969. And during that time, the whole world changed. You had Um, the Vietnam War, you had the dawn and then the sort of explosion of rock and roll music, you had the sexual revolution, you had the, um, uh, the, the dawn of feminism and the, the feminist movement. In the United States, you had uh, the civil rights movement and all of the impact that that had. And going to the moon was part of all of those revolutions. It was part of this huge cultural change. And, and to be honest, the, the sort of modernization of technology and computing and what we as human beings thought we were capable of. And so it, it sort of pulled together a lot of those things into a single shining moment. Yes, the United States beat the Russians to the moon, but in doing that, it stopped being a rivalry. The, the whole world felt like Not the Americans are going to the moon to beat the Russians, but the world felt like human beings are going to the moon. And this is going to be, this is a great joy. 
and a great achievement and something we're all participating in. And, and, and in some ways, that was one of the most extraordinary elements of it. Reading the book, I was surprised to learn that there was no overwhelming support for the project. Uh, as a matter of fact, Kennedy was not all that excited in the beginning, but he bet his uh, political career and the standing of the U.S. by making the declaration that he made uh, at the beginning of the project, just out, uh, as the Bay of Pigs had happened, and just as the Sputnik one was there, Yuri Gagarin. Uh, tell me about that, that period of time and how Kennedy goes to that point and how he galvanized the American people. Well, you make, you make a really interesting point. First of all, although Kennedy campaigned on this idea of a, of a new generation taking command of new frontiers, he was the first president in 1961, he was the first president who hadn't been born in the 1800s. Eisenhower had been born back in whatever, 1885 or something. That's an extraordinary period. And, uh, and yet he wasn't that interested in space travel, even though he portrayed himself as sort of the president of the new frontier, so to speak. But then um, the, the Soviets continued their space achievements, including April 12th, which was a Wednesday. Uh, they launched, April 12th, 1961, they launched the first human being into space. The reaction to that was overwhelming. I think the Kennedy administration Un, they knew it was coming, but they kind of underestimated uh, this sort of worldwide explosion of interest, congratulations, uh, adulation for Yuri Gagarin, the, the Soviet cosmonaut, and the, the Soviet achievement. There was a, just everywhere in the communist world, there was this sense, you know, China and, and, uh, and, and the Soviet Union and their satellites, there was this sense that that communism was, was the dominant force, the, the, the system that could send people into space. Um, but even in a place like Britain, there were people saying sending a human being into space was the most extraordinary achievement since Columbus coming to America. And then that was on a Wednesday. On Saturday, the Bay of Pigs invasion began, the, the invasion of Cuba stage managed by the CIA that was designed to overthrow Castro. And, and literally by Monday, three days later, Castro had surrounded the invaders, Castro himself leading the soldiers. He wasn't, he wasn't leading from Havana. He was out there on the battlefield. And, and, and within literally 72, 96 hours, those American-backed uh, uh, rebels who, who thought they were going to overthrow Castro had been surrounded, captured, and imprisoned. And it was a, a second worldwide humiliation for the United States, literally in, in five days. And this was, you know, in the third or fourth month of the Kennedy presidency. So uh, Kennedy said to his advisors, you, you have to tell me, how can we uh, leapfrog the Soviet Union in space? What can we do that will show exactly how outstanding we were? Nobody really thought the Russians were better at all this stuff than the Americans. The Russians had just decided to pay attention to it. And the answer was, sir, you can, you can announce that we're going to the moon, <laughs> and then you can figure out how to get us the resources we need to do it. If you get us the resources, we will do it. You, you, you said one interesting thing. You said that there was never tremendous support. It's really interesting, even in the wake of the speech that Kennedy gave, where he said we should go to the moon, and then a year later, he gave another legendary speech that was just devoted to how important going to the moon was. That was in 1962 at Rice University. Not even half of Americans, when asked, during the moon race, during Apollo, never 50% of Americans said it was a good idea. So Kennedy and Congress, and then after his assassination, Lyndon Johnson, they, they literally pulled Americans to, to all the way to the moon um, without tremendous political support. We, we have this sense looking back that this was such a great achievement. People, people, you know, rallied to it. It was so wonderful. And that was true once we started landing on the moon. But during the eight years it took to get there, um, uh, it, it was never a hugely popular program compared with everything else that was going on in the world. 
Thank you, Charles. Uh, one of the amazing things that I learned in the book is that there was a uh, number of young people who really made it possible because they had to create everything. Tell us about it. I mean, look, it, it's kind of amazing. On the day that Apollo 11 landed on the moon in mission control, that image we have of, of these people sitting at computer screens helping guide the spaceship to the surface of the moon, the average age of the people sitting at those computer consoles was 27. Well, think about that for a minute. It was 1969. That means that most of those people were either in high school or college when Kennedy said, let's go to the moon. They, were, they weren't even working in the space program at the moment Kennedy said, let's do it. Um, the spacesuits are, are, are a wonderful example. The spacesuits uh, had to be invented from scratch. They were, a spacesuit is really a tiny little spaceship built just for one. It has to protect the astronaut from, from the, the, all the rigors of space. The spacesuits were the work of Playtex, the, the women's bra and girdle company. Playtex stepped up and, and, and bid to make them and their, their engineering was so creative, they were given uh, the contract. Um, and the guy who ran it for Playtex in the end was 30 years old when the spacesuits first <laughs> walked on the moon, when Armstrong and Aldrin stepped out and walked on the moon, the guy in charge of those spacesuits was just 30 years old. He'd been, he'd been at Playtex for nine years, but what an extraordinary thing. These weren't, these weren't people who had come through World War II and were 55 years old. Um, and, and that was true at MIT, the people who programmed the computers, Many of them were hired in the early and mid 1960s to do a kind of computer programming that had never been done before, straight out of college. And so it was an inspirational effort for that generation of young people. But I think there's something also important. The, the, the people in charge at the very top were, were in fact, most of them World War II veterans. So they were in their mid 40s to mid 50s. And why that's important is they had seen what America could do when it needed to. They had, they had seen America pull together and win World War II. And so the idea that, that you had this huge army of people, 400,000 people, they knew that those 400,000 people could accomplish what seemed like an impossible task because they'd seen us do it before. Let's go for a short break and we will be back in only moments. We are back with uh, Charles Fishman, an amazing book that uh, we're talking about. Charles, um, the Apollo mission impacted people in many different ways, but I was very taken by it. Uh, the experiences of those who participated, like the one who we were just talking about, uh, design and uh, created an astronaut suit. He wasn't really too happy of what was going on on the moon while everybody else was enjoying. And then uh, uh, regular ladies who were in charge of folding the parachutes, they had to change also the way they live because they had to do certain things. Tell us about it. Well, the, the, the guy who was in charge of the spacesuits was named Sonny Ream. And, and there was this amazing moment. So the the, the spacesuit team from Playtex um, was in Houston for the moonwalk to give advice in case something went wrong. There were, there were 40 or 50 of them there. And they were watching in real time as Armstrong and Aldrin walked around the moon. And um, Buzz Aldrin in particular got pretty active. He ran around, he jogged, he bunny hopped, he, he ran as fast as he could. And, and not just Sonny Ream who was in charge, but, but the people who had worked with him to design and build the spacesuits, they were very nervous. There's, there's video of them talking about how they just wanted the astronauts to get back in the spaceship and close it up. They were worried this should have been the highlight of their career, right? They, they're out there on the moon in the spacesuits they designed and built, but they were worried that something was gonna go wrong and that the astronauts would get in trouble and that they were stressing the spacesuits too hard. And, you know, that was an important moment for me when I discovered that video clip. There wasn't anything wrong with the spacesuits. They worked perfectly. But we know how the story came out. 
We know that every single moon mission was a success. Even Apollo 13, which was almost a disaster, was a success because everybody pulled together, including the astronauts on Apollo 13, and rescued them. But at the moment, they didn't know how it was going to come out. And so it was really interesting to watch them talk about how nervous they were about their role and their part. And so that really changed how I approached it. It's easy. When you know it succeeded, you tell the story one way. When you don't know what's going to happen, you tell the story a different way. Now, you, you were talking about the, 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 the women, the, the people who folded the parachutes. I think there were actually uh, two, two uh, men and one woman. There's three people who folded all the parachutes that brought the spaceship down through the atmosphere safely into the Pacific Ocean. They, they were the only three people in the whole world who were certified to fold the parachutes. They folded all the parachutes for all the missions and they were considered so valuable. And of course that was done by hand, which is interesting. They were considered so valuable to NASA that they were forbidden to ride in the same car at the same time. They couldn't even go out to lunch together because NASA was worried there would be a car accident and then who would fold the parachutes? So there were 410,000 people. That's an army. That's a city of people. But, Every one of those 410,000 people was an individual, and individuals really had an impact on the shape of the program, on what happened, and on the safety and success of the astronauts. That's amazing, the stories. You know, for all the criticism of the government, uh, uh, the mission to the moon was completed under budget and on time. And comparatively to uh, the Vietnam War, for example, it was... Uh, not as expensive. Uh, it was also, as you said, the largest civilian project. Uh, just uh, about 50 states in the United States got involved with, with some kind of funding in the project. Tell us about that massive uh, operation. Well, it, I mean, it was, it was the largest non-wartime project ever undertaken by, by human beings ever. Bigger than the Panama Canal, three times the the, the scale of the Manhattan Project, 10 times the size of the Panama Canal, bigger even than the building of the pyramids. Um, it, as you said, uh, uh, NASA was very careful in political terms to make sure everybody got a, a piece of it. Every single state in America had Apollo contracts going on. Um, but it, it was also this demonstration of incredible, it was also this demonstration of incredible competence and care. It, 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 wasn't just, it isn't just interesting to compare to the Vietnam War. Apollo going to the moon and the Vietnam War were happening at exactly the same time. One of them uh, managed brilliantly. Uh, people talk about Apollo being expensive. The total cost of going to the moon was less than one year of the 11-year Vietnam War. So, so it, it, was, it was a lot of money, but it but if we could afford the Vietnam War, we could have afforded to go to the moon 10 more times. And it, as you said, it came in on budget. This is what it's going to cost. And that's what it ended up costing on time by the end of the decade. And, and you left out the big one. It was also a success. The Vietnam War turned out to be a moment, uh, uh, an episode in which the government consistently lied about what was going on. It eroded confidence that Americans had in their government. and we didn't accomplish any of the things we hoped to accomplish. In many ways, we, we, we did exactly the opposite. We eroded faith in our ability to get things done. And so in some ways, going to the moon is a, is a good case study. It's, it's worth revisiting the story because we did what we said we were going to do. It was an extraordinary thing to undertake. And you know what? We have big problems today. If we could go to the moon, we can tackle climate change. One of the most important things is that a project like this takes leadership. It takes eloquence. Eloquence is underrated, but we need someone to say, here's the problem. Here's what we need to do. Let's solve it. Here's the goal. Go do it. And then people will rally to the cause. They, we love being asked to do something really hard, impossible, and then proving that it's actually possible. You know, going to the moon had the effect to brand the expectations of the, uh, on the United States domestically and internationally. I, as a, as a young kid, 
I listened through the Voice of America, all the landing, all the description and all that. We couldn't see it on TV. But we always thought if the U.S. can do the moon, they can do everything. And also in the United States, there was the same perception at the end, even when we were not on the moon yet. And, and uh, so has that spirit, do you think, uh, kind of marked the United States moving forward? Uh, wh what do you think happened with that? Well, I, I think it, I think both Americans and out in the world in, the, in that Cold War environment, I think planting the American flag on the moon definitely, to use your phrase, sort of branded America as capable of doing whatever it set out to do. Now, since then, there have been some, some great successes and some great failures, you know? We, 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 don't, we don't actually always succeed at what we set our mind to. Um, there's no peace in the Middle East. The American soldiers are still in Afghanistan. They're still in Iraq. Um, there are all kinds of places uh, where we haven't solved the problem. Of course, a war, visiting a different society, trying to bring democracy to a different culture, if you're not paying attention, in some ways that's very different than setting a kind of technical or engineering goal and, and chasing it down, right? Human problems, problems of human behavior, are much different. One thing people say, though, is that we should have spent the money solving problems back on Earth. In fact, the 1960s were an era when Americans cut the poverty rate, expanded opportunity for all kinds of folks who'd been discriminated against. So we didn't neglect the problems at home. What I would say is that, is that when you read about that era, when you read the stories, when you hear the voices of the people who did it, you cannot help but be inspired. And so I, I, for me, it's a, it's, it's a reminder that we really are capable of tackling big problems. And I, and I don't think that's a uniquely American trait, but America has the resources and, and the reputation and the leadership ability to help the rest of the world muster itself in, in the right direction as well. And so that, that's missing a little bit in the conversation right now. And that to me is why, you know, the, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing uh, is, is a great moment to stop and say, you know what, there's, there's nothing like leadership behind really powerful goals. And sometimes leadership requires, you know, the biggest economy and the biggest democracy to take a step forward. It, there's no Americans. Americans make mistakes all the time, but but uh, when we set our hearts to something uh, that's worthwhile, we we can really accomplish it. Uh, you um, study uh, this program. What are those myths uh, that are out there that doesn't allow us to fully appreciate the Apollo program? What things have been set up in stone that we think uh, one of those that before I read your book, I thought it was the most expensive program. Uh, another myth that I had was that every American was on board from day number one. What are the things in Peter's to understand the fullness of the, the program? Right. I mean, I think those are two important ones. It cost a lot of money, but it wasn't expensive relative to all kinds of things we were spending money on. And by the way, we got our money's worth, right? We went and there's this other big myth that going to the moon didn't get us anything. It got us a pretty picture of the earth. It got us tang and milk. Milk milk. <laughs> yeah. Right? But, but in fact, the digital revolution, the reason you and I can speak over the internet, uh, our, our smartphones, our iPhones, Apollo laid the foundation for all of that. Apollo created the smallest, fastest, most nimble computer that had ever been created. And that computer rode on the spaceships to the moon and back. We couldn't have gone without it. They took technology that was the size of four or five big refrigerators lined up together. That was a small computer in 1961. And they made it the size of a briefcase. And the briefcase was better than the refrigerators. That laid the foundation for your iPhone and your laptop computer. So the idea that we quote unquote got nothing, that's another, that's another myth. I think the other thing that we've forgotten is how hard it was. 
when Kennedy said, let's go to the moon, it wasn't just a dream, it was impossible. There was no rocket big enough to fly to the moon. There was no computer, as I just said, small enough to fly to the moon. There were no spacesuits. There was no spaceship that could land on another world safely. In eight years, they invented all of that. You know, in, in the United States sometimes, it can take us eight years to replace a worn out bridge now. Sort of like, wait, are they still working on that? And so it is a reminder what you can do when you set your mind to it. And, and, and I think that's really, really valuable too, because you can get a little discouraged with the pace of change in the, in the modern world, not with the pace of change of your iPhone or your, or your laptop computer, but it can sometimes feel like big problems don't get solved. And so this is a story that if you step back in time and, and just enjoy the, the, the story itself, you can see how a sense of urgency and a sense of focus can really help us. So it, it didn't cost too much. It got, it got us a lot. It was actually a really, really, really challenging undertaking. I think all those things are really important. You know, one of my favorite moments when I discovered this, the book begins with the sentence, the moon has a smell. And people are astonished at that. How do we even know it has a smell? The astronauts got back in their spaceship, sealed the hatch, pressurized again, took off their spacesuits. And when they took off their helmets, the, the lunar module cabin was filled with the smell of burned charcoal, which they were very surprised at. And the, the burned charcoal smell was coming from the moon dirt that they had tracked back in. And and it, it, there was some kind of chemical reaction. They don't actually quite understand it. But by the time they got home to Earth, the smell was gone. All six astronauts who walked on the moon smelled the smell and commented on it in, in you know, live recordings back to, the, back to Earth. But, but the smell was gone by the time they got back. And so that's a reason you send human beings. No robot is going to tell you what the moon smells like. Thank you for the time, energy, and the perspective you gave uh, to this, uh, to the Apollo program, to uh, to this amazing um, endeavor that you know makes all us uh, humans, regardless of nationalities and colors of the skin, proud that uh, if we put our minds together to do something, uh, we can do it. It is a book that I recommend everyone. Uh, not only that you will find yourself uh, in the pages, but you will be inspired by it. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Thank you so much. It's such a fun story to tell. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.